<clears throat> so today is uh, Radhashtami, a very special day in our Gaudiya tradition. Krishna appears on Jamashtami also just um, I guess it's been about what it's been about 15 days exactly or 14 days exactly it's one lunar cycle so we're halfway through the lunar cycle and then now we're again halfway through it and so Radha and Krishna each appear halfway through the lunar cycle and then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu appears on Purnima which is the full moon and so one of our theologians made the point that if you take two half moons and you put them together it makes a full moon and so Radha and Krishna put together becomes Chaitanya Mahaprabhu there, there's a verse which says this it says that Radha Bhava Dyuti Suvalitam Naomi Krishna Sorupam. I offer my respects to that person who's Krishna Swarup. He's Krishna himself. Swarup here means he's fundamentally Krishna. But he's Radha Bhava Dyuti Suvalitam. He's adorned with the complexion of Radharani. And so Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is Gaur Govind. He's Golden Govinda, Gaur Gopal, Gaur Keshava. These are all names of Mahaprabhu. He's Goranga, Radharani's Gorangi. He's Goranga, the male, golden limbed one, golden Keshava. You're looking confused. You're not? It's just naturally you look confused? Okay. He's golden Keshava. He's golden Gopal, the cowherd boy. He's golden Govind, the one who pleases the senses, the cows, and the land. These are all epithets for Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. You guys hear me okay? Okay. I think you were trying to look like you were paying attention, but it just ended up you were looking bewildered. And so I got confused. I thought maybe I wasn't speaking clearly. Huh? It's better? Turn it up for me. Okay. Better now? All right. <clears throat> I mean, I could yell, but it sort of defeats the purpose of having a microphone <laughs> with an adjustable knob. So I know like, my friend wants me to yell, but I'm a, I'm a little lazy like that. We'll just turn up the knob and then we're good. Um, so to really appreciate Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, you have to appreciate Radharani and Krishna, both. When Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's glories, his most, his antaranga hetu, his internal reasons for his appearance are broadcast in the fourth chapter of the Adi Lila. Practically the whole chapter is dedicated to describing Radharani. And Krishnadas Kaviraj, the poet, says if you want to understand Chaitanya, you have to understand Radharani, so I'm going to explain to you Radharani, and that's really the, the bulk of the chapter spent doing that. So, if our Gaudiya revelation, our whole idea of Panchatattva, even the worship of Gaur and the Thai, um, Gorgadadhar, even a single deity of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, even the way Jagannath is conceived of, at least by our tradition, the whole thing ties back to Radharani. And so, and, and there's a famous 
statement by Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati, Prabhupada's guru. He said, if you worship Vishnu, you are called a Vaishnava. It means derivative of child of Vishnu. Um, and then if you worship Krishna, you're called a You're called a Karshna. You add an A to the first syllable and the last syllable. So Vishnu becomes Vaishnava because the U with an A added becomes a V and then the I with an A added becomes AI and so it becomes Vaishnava. Vishnu becomes Vaishnava. And so Krishna becomes Karshna. And then he makes the point if you worship Radharani, you are known as a a what? A Godia. So, so the Godia is the name of the place we come from. It's actually a misnomer. We're really Chaitanya Vaishnavas because there were other groups of Vaishnavas in Godadesh in Bengal around the 15th, 16th century. So calling us Godias is, is technically a misnomer because it would, it would only work if we were the only group of Vaishnavas that became popular in Bengal in the 15th and 16th century, but that wasn't the case. But regardless, our tradition is known as the Gaudiya tradition, the tradition of Godadesh, which is the old name for Bengal. And so Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati was making the point that if you are a follower of Radharani, you're called a Godia. So we're all Godia Vaishnavs. That's the name of our lineage, which then means we're all. Did you guys do that? It was pretty simple arithmetic. Did you guys do that? We're all what? That's it. So the Panchatattva has Chaitanya Mahaprabhu as Krishna in the mood of Radharani. Even Gornatai, the great preachers, because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was golden, Radharani is still there. What to speak of Gorgadadhar deities, what to speak of Mahaprabhu by himself, there's no way in any of our systems of worship that came from our Gaudiya revelation to get around Radharani because Chaitanya Mahaprabhu is there and he's yellow and it's atypical. And that yellowness is because Radharani's mood has become predominant. Even Jagannath, in our revelation, Jagannath is Krishna who's become wide-eyed. His eyes opened up real wide. And he's in ecstasy, so his limbs shrunk and he became stunned and overwhelmed with love of God. And why? Because he heard Radharani and the devotees talk about their love for Krishna. And he was listening to them and he became stunned. And Baladeva and Subhadra were there too. And so they also became stunned. And that's the deities of Jagannath, Baladeva, and Subhadra. And the Ratayatra that we celebrate is Radharani and the Brijbasis pulling Krishna back to Vrindavan from Kurukshetra where they met him after a long separation. You, you almost can't, it's, you know, like they say everybody's connected by six degrees of separation or less. Nothing in our lineage is more than one degree away from Radharani. Subhadra herself is an iteration, an incarnation of the goddess, and the original goddess that everybody is incarnated from is Radharani. Radharani is actually not a devotee of Krishna. We say that, and there's a reason why we say that, and we'll get into that today. But Radharani is not actually a devotee of Krishna. It's a, it's a, mis, it's a philosophical, theological misunderstanding. Radharani is Krishna. She's God. We have a dual conception of divinity. We have a masculine and a feminine moiety 
two halves of a whole, and our conception of divinity is Radha and Krishna. We always worship, I mean, we always have a deity of Radharani there. Even like if you go to the Radharaman temple in Vrindavan, where they worship Radharamanji, they have a golden coin there that they also worship as Radharani next to the deity. There's a whole history of Krishna deities having Radharani deities made and then transported to those temples to complete the temple. So a deity of Krishna revealed itself and then the Gaudias had to get a deity of Radharani to then be with that deity of Krishna so that the worship would be complete. You look at all the temples, all the main temples in Vrindavan, they all have a deity of Radharani. This was such a big deal that the Govinda deity, Govinda Dev in Jaipur, it was a huge thing. Um, in the early 1700s that, you know, we worshipped Radha and Krishna and it was disturbing to the Rajputs and the locals there in Rajasthan. They didn't understand the idea of worshipping Krishna and Radharani. They understood Krishna and Rukmini or Lakshmi and Narayan or Varaha um, Lakshmi Varaha, Lakshmi Narasimha. Varaha is actually Bhumi Dev, excuse me. They had different ways they would worship Vishnu with his consort. But the idea of Radha and Krishna did not make sense to them. And so they were trying to say we couldn't worship Radha Govinda. We had a deity of Govinda, we made a deity of Radha Rani to go with that deity of Govinda. Then we worshiped them, the Muslims came, so we ran to Jaipur. We set up the worship there, and then outside of our home area, uh, outsiders got a chance to see our style of worship. It disturbed them, and there was a big debate about it. We won, and that's why we worship Radha Govinda in Jaipur to this day. It's the primary deity of the whole city of Jaipur. But there was a minute there where they were going to stop it. And stop it, there was no separation of church and state. So when the king became disturbed by the thing, and called a whatever, some kind of a, a panel discussion or some sort of symposium or some sort like something was you know convened. If we lost, they they would have stopped us. Like physically, they would have stopped us. And so this uh, public worship of Radha and Krishna. We're not the only ones. These Hitari Vangsan. Valab, there's other groups that worship Radharani and Krishna together. We're not the only ones. But our, ourselves and our sister tribes popularized this on a level that was never seen before in the world around the time Christopher Columbus discovered America. As part of a massive bhakti revival that ran the length and breadth of India. And so, the Gaudiya thing is the addition of Radharani to the Krishna equation. That's, that's what we did. That's what Chaitanya Mahaprabhu did. That's what his followers did. So the statement that if you worship Radharani, you're a Gaudiya, it's not just a cool, like, caught you slipping thing where you know you think you're thinking like Radha or something like that you're trying to figure out how to say you're a Radha you're trying to figure it out and so it's, it's not like that it's a it's, it's a philosophical theological point our tradition is different and distinct from other groups primarily because we worship Radharani with Krishna that doesn't fully distinguish us like I said, there's a few other sister tribes mainly flourishing in the area of Vrindavan. Hit Harivangs, Vallabhacharya, there's a few other groups that have followers there. And, and they also worship Radharani. And there was some cross-pollination between us and them. But it, 
distinguishes us from hundreds of millions of Vaishnavas that exist. And, and, and Vaishnavism is the major religion of India, and so you know, hundreds of millions of Vaishnavas exist in India, and it, this distinguishes us from 90 plus percent of them, maybe 95 percent of them, something like that. Um, people worship Bal Gopal, Krishna, with a little piece of butter. That's actually Ladu Gopal. Bal Gopal, they call it Bal Gopal. Bal just means a child, Krishna. Krishna is the form of a child, not necessarily with a lump of butter. Ladu Gopal, he's got that lump, which I guess is a Ladu, although I've always thought of it as being a piece of butter. But anyway. I guess he's called Ladu Gopal. You can't claim it's a piece of butter. Um, you, it's not that statues of Krishna and worship of Krishna didn't exist in the Indian subcontinent. It did. But this, this idea that Radha Krishna represents a zenith of spiritual evolution. That's us. That's our thing. So, just, I, I thought what we would do today is, I wanted to, there's some verses I wanted to look at, but I think before I give the verses, I'm just going to give you guys a little description of who Radharani is to us. <clears throat> there's a source of all existence. A triple O God, a God who's all good, all powerful, and all knowing. That deity is fundamentally loving. That deity is fundamentally a loving deity. A personal, individual, loving, omnipotent, omnibenevolent being. That's the source of all existence. Krishna is also all powerful, but Krishna's power is really a, a, a less attractive feature of divinity. Love is what gives rise to mercy and grace. Power is what gives rise to justice. Power is about control. L love is about sharing, reciprocation. Love necessitates relativity. Because to love somebody, you have to empathize with them. You have to understand them, which means you have to allow them to affect you on some level. If you say, I, I love you and nothing you do matters to me, that type of love is really crippled. There's nothing you can do to hurt me. There's nothing you can do to affect me. I would argue, at least I'm arguing right now today, that a love which is unaffected by anything isn't actually love. A deity who didn't miss us and cry and wasn't sad that we, when we turn away, wouldn't actually be a loving deity. Love depends on empathy. Love depends on, therefore, relativity. And therefore, an ultimate loving being would also be not only supremely absolute, but also supremely relative. This, by the way, is called dipolar. Dipolar. My duo, di, dvi in Sanskrit, dipolar, two-side theology. It's our theology. In Western thought, it's the byproduct of someone named Alfred North Whitehead building on the work of Plato thousands of years later. Plato said some stuff, everybody missed it. This guy caught it. And, uh, and then he had a follower named Charles Hartshorn, who actually studied with a Man Man Brat Brahmachari who came to the University of Chicago in the 40s and was a Godia and a follower, a scholar of Jiva Goswami, and Charles Hartshorn studied under him.
So this is actually our tradition. It's, like I said, it had, took its birth in Western philosophy, but it's, it's actually our position. Krishna is a subversive notion about divinity, that God, instead of being a parent who's just providing you with things, becomes a child and you can give something to Krishna. Bilva Mangotakura says, you might worship Krishna as the lord of the yogis and the supreme Brahman, but I worship Krishna. I can't get the image out of my head of Krishna carrying his father's shoes. A child who loves his father so much, he's carrying his father's shoes on his head as a servant. That image stuck in Bilva Mangotakura's head. Before Chaitanya Mahaprabhu ever descended into the planet, this stuff was being written about by precursors to our tradition. Jai Dev Goswami, Chandidas Vidyapati, Bilva Mangotakura, Bojade was a famous commentator. They were beginning to explore these concepts. So, so it wasn't that Mahaprabhu touched down in, in a completely uh, a fallow field. It had already been rejuvenated and readied. And there were people having ideas about the nature of God and the ultimate expression of God. Radharani had already been introduced in the equation too. So, um, a proper conception of the deity would involve being both supremely absolute as well as relative. Being fully active, but also to some extent, but also passive, because there's good ways in which we're passive, there's good ways in which we're relative. Like I mentioned before, empathy. Also, if you claim there was a love, but a love devoid of empathy, I don't know, it sounds like not something I'd want to get ultra close to. So even if you want to dispute the idea of that love requires empathy, then you are left with an unempathetic deity, because at least empathy, by its very definition, involves putting yourself in another's shoes and being relative, relativized to them. By seeing yourself in relationship to them. Did you guys follow this? So our conception of Krishna, he doesn't have a chakra, he plays a flute. He's not an adult, he's a child. He's not your father and mother, he's your child. He's not looking for justice, he's looking for, to give mercy and grace. His power doesn't scare you. His beauty intrigues you and seduces you. Krishna is Kamadev. He's the god of love. A name for Krishna is Kamadev. The seventh Gayatri mantra we chant, the, the mantra you get when you take second initiation, is the Kama Gayatri. It's to Kamdev, Krishna, the transcendental Cupid. Who shoots flower arrows at you. He shoots you, he slays you. But what's he slay you with? Flower arrows. Cupid is famous. Cupid's weapon is a, a bow that shoots flower arrows and pierces the heart and makes you fall in love. That's Krishna. We chant that three times a day when we chant our Gayatri. We pray to Krishna who shoots us with his flower arrows and pierces our heart. Now, there's something called the Yusufro dilemma which we're just going to briefly touch on, and it's not for no reason. So just really pay attention right now. There's, there's, there, I, there's kind of two things people do with theology. Number one is they try to establish that there's a deity and troubleshoot the obvious objections. If there's a deity that's all good, why is there evil in this world? Like, just like, why should I believe in anything at all? It's, it's kind of one thing. It's, it's very much, it's like entry-level theology. And essentially you're talking to atheists who are combative, who are angry, who are upset because they dropped their lollipop. And, and you have to troubleshoot just the, 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 the bones, the foundation. 
why you should believe in anything, why you should believe in God, why God's a person, how God can be good, etc. Just those basic things. Why is there suffering? Why do sometimes children are born with a congenital heart defect and they die? Like that kind of stuff. It's not light, but it's, it's the beginning of belief in God. That's one side. Then there's the other side. The other side is once you've accepted this, what can you do with it? And what's your conception of God? And kind of like, what's your relationship with God? And what's the nature of that deity? Once you've done this, and usually this leads into this, you start to sort of see the field over here. But then by the time you get over here, you're no longer trying to prove that anymore. You're not trying to win the girl. You got the girl, and now you're deciding where to go on your honeymoon. Like, like the, the first, like, is, is she or he going to like me? Are they going to find me attractive? And so on and so forth. By the time you're married, maybe if you've done it right, then this is like a few days into the honeymoon because you haven't fully consummated your relationship until after marriage. But at least some days after the honeymoon, these questions are no longer on the table. You know each other fully and you're comfortable with each other fully and you can begin to make a life together because you're not trying to woo each other or impress each other. You can actually start living together. Did you follow this? You shouldn't get complacent. Get a dad bod and just let everything <laughs> fall apart. There's some value bringing your A-game the whole way through. But, but that point notwithstanding, there's the beginning of a relationship, and then there's once that relationship has begun, once that relationship has gotten where it needs to go, once that relationship has gotten where it needs to go, and you've started, then you can start to really live and really do amazing things together because you're not just trying to get off the ground. A, a real relationship shouldn't just be like you're always going from zero to one. I was talking to somebody today who I've known for years about somebody I've known for minutes and somehow they had the idea that I was as close to the person I know for minutes as I was to them after knowing them for years. And I, I, I said, like, how shallow do you think I am? Like, why would I care about somebody equivalently after knowing them for minutes that I do after serving alongside you for years? That's like, it's actually an insult to me. I mean, it's, it means you got a serious problem and the way you look at the world that you've become like are some, somewhat impervious to my my feeling but it also just it's like actually insulting to the person you're talking to you guys with me so at some point you get beyond that first step and then you get into this realm of you know what is your relationship with God look like what does God look like that's where we are today it's also a lot of theology is like science it's logic it's math with ideas you're putting together arguments over here, theology becomes more artistic. Who can paint the most beautiful picture? Now, it's more like architecture than pure art because there is still some structure to it. So even within this field over here, you still have to show and demonstrate some ability to think logically. We call that rasa tattva, lila tattva. And so you have siddhanta and tattva over here, and then you have rasa and Leela over here. Tattva versus Leela, Sadanta versus Rasa. But then within this realm of Rasa, you have Rasa Tattva and Rasa Sadanta. So there's still a structure like an architect makes art but also follows the laws of physics. Dali doesn't follow the laws of physics. Picasso didn't follow the laws of physics. I mean, technically they did because they were putting paint on a paper and 
the rules of gravity applied, some other stuff, entropy is there as well. So it's not that they're absolutely free from, but you understand the point I'm making. Surrealist work is cool because it defies what the actual world looked like. And abstraction defies, cubism is a form of abstraction, it defies what the world looks like. That was Picasso's style. So, within letting your mind soar, there's still some structure. And so it's like a beautiful piece of architecture. Ideally. So today's class is really about painting a picture for what we think God looks like and what we think God's nature is, how God feels, what are God's personality traits. And so Krishna is the supreme being. Krishna is a person, not with a body made out of flesh and blood like you, but with a body made out of eternality, bliss, and knowledge. But Krishna is a person in the sense that Krishna is a being with a conscience and consciousness, with will, with thought, with the capacity for love, with all the attributes that an individual being has and none of the deficits in our iteration with bodies made out of flesh and blood and inadequacies. All the pluses, no, no minuses. Again, just like with relativity, there's pluses of relativity, like empathy. There's pluses to being an individual and a person. Namely, the capacity to love and feel and think, which an impersonal deity would not have. So, there's something called the use of dilemma. It goes back to Socrates, or at least Plato, and it's in Socrates' mouth. But the use of dilemma is that, does God love things which are good? Now, pay attention here. If God loves things that are good, then they are good before God loves them. Therefore, their goodness is independent of God. Therefore, their goodness doesn't come from God. Therefore, they are above God and a priori to God. They're before God. Did you follow that? Now God is the source of everything. That's one horn of the youth of her dilemma. If alternatively you say that God makes things good. Then that means that nothing is intrinsically good or bad. And the entire structure of the universe is arbitrary and whimsical. And rape and murder, if God chosen to be, would be good. And there is no structure to the universe, which of course goes against your basic experience that some things are good and some things are bad, and it leaves you in this wanton and whimsical and totally arbitrary universe where there is no structure other than the whimsy of God. Do you guys follow that? It's a dilemma because you've got to pick one. Which one do you pick? You don't want to pick either one. Usually devotees will say, oh, yeah, Krishna can tell us a lie and cheat and run off. The gopis run off. But it's not really the way we feel. We don't really feel like they did that. We feel like they're Krishna's eternal angels and it's just an illusion that they're married to somebody else and, 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 and running off. So the resolution to the Euthyphro dilemma is to conceive of God as personified goodness. We think of goodness as an attribute floating in space as another thing. There's God and there's goodness. And so God either likes goodness or doesn't like goodness or makes it, but it's a separate thing. And therefore you've got to figure out which one came first. By changing your conception and conceiving of God as goodness personified, all you're doing now is you're saying, I'm not an impersonalist. And I believe that the ultimate manifestation of reality is a personal one because I believe that the ultimate source of reality is personal and therefore everything in its first instance is also personal and therefore goodness has a name and that name is Krishna. And goodness looks like somebody, it's a little blue boy who takes care of the cows. And so the quality of goodness is actually derivative of the person goodness. And so you're already one step down from transcendence when you're seeing goodness as being distinct 
from God. You've already bought into the illusion. Shh. Not you, but whoever was out there. Did you guys follow that? I'm not going to say it again. It made sense. If you were paying attention, you should have been able to follow it. So, that resolves the use of fertile dilemma because now when you say, does God love that which is good, what you're really saying is, does God love things which are like himself? Things which are of his own nature. <laughs> this is there in the book of John in the Bible. In the book of John in the Bible, it says, in the beginning was Logos, and Logos was Theos. Same doubt is there. Is God logical? Right? Does God like logic? Does it have to follow the rules of logic? Well, the rules of logic, the original logic, like logic in its original iteration, the first manifestation of logic, the origin of logic is Krishna is the supreme logic. Logic has a name. The name is Krishna. Krishna is logic. The quality of logic is when you see remnants of Krishna or things which are similar to Krishna in this world and therefore they're logical and reasonable because they are Krishna-like. When you see things that are good in this world, then you're seeing things that are Krishna-like. Do you follow this? Okay. Remember how I said sometimes within this position over here, there's philosophy and that's why it's more like architecture? Okay. Radharani is love of Krishna. Radharani is Krishna's heart. Radharani is Krishna. Every goddess is an incarnation of Radharani. Radharani and Krishna are actually one dual conception of the Absolute. And specifically, Radharani is Mahabhav Swarupini. Swarupini. Mahabhav Swarupini. She is the embodiment of the purest, most ecstatic love that is Krishna. Therefore, Radharani is the essence of Krishna. Sometimes we say Radharani is Krishna's devotee, but that's not technically correct. It's not correct. Because she's actually Krishna. That's why we worship the two of them on the altar together. <laughs> and our conception, by and large, Godia's conception, is that we want to go back to heaven and we want to become young, prepubescent, cowherd girls in training that are never quite at an age where we dance with Krishna ourselves, but we perpetually help Radha and Krishna and the other Sakis to dance in ecstasy in the divine dance of love. That's our idea. And in that manifestation, we favor Radharani. We're always on Radharani's side. When Krishna and Radharani fight, we're on Radharani's side. Of course, we want Radha and Krishna to be together, but our understanding of reality in divine madness, in a corner of heaven, the highest echelon of heaven, where our lineage resides, they're followers of Radharani. They're, they're protected maidservants of Radharani. And they live a life of service primarily to Radharani, which is why they've got that feminine form. Then they also take birth in Navadip eternally alongside Chaitanya Mahaprabhu. And they become Brahmins. Brahmin boys, and they do kirtan with Mahaprabhu, and they assist Radha and Krishna, and they realize that both those things are one and the same, just appearing miraculously in two different forms. And the kirtan party becomes the Ras Lila, and the Ras Lila becomes the kirtan party, and that's our understanding of what we aspire for. Krishna says that when Radharani chastises me, 
it, her words of chastisement steal my mind away from the hymns of the Vedas. So there's thousands of Brahmanas chanting the hymns of the Vedas, trying to attract the attention of Krishna. And Krishna can't hear them because Radharani is chastising him and he's attracted to that. Because a deity that was the transcendental Cupid would think like that. Formal ritual would get trumped every time by ecstatic love. Krishna has to forget he's God, as do his devotees, because if they remembered he was God, they wouldn't be able to love him as completely. That's why there's Yoga Maya. Vrindavan is there as a village, because in a big palatial city, you couldn't actually love completely, and in a very simple way. Krishna wears a peacock feather, because he's picking up it off the forest floor. Krishna is the source of every gem which has ever existed. Gems are beautiful because they look like Krishna. Krishna's picking up a peacock feather, decorating his hair. Peacock feathers are all over the forest floor. He's wearing a garland made of forest flowers. Not big, fancy, garden-grown flowers. Just random flowers picked out of the forest. Nothing special. The devotees of New Vrindavan went to uh, Detroit to meet Prabhupada. Prabhupada was a big guru. Let me explain what I mean. Devotees had made garlands for Prabhupada out of $100 bills. They flew in flowers from Thailand. Lotus flowers. Made lotus flower garlands for Prabhupada. It was ridiculous what the devotees would do. John Lennon picked him up in a white Rolls Royce. I, he, like, you know, he flew first class. Lufthansa stopped him and let, let, like made a special session for Prabhupada at the Heathrow Airport. All the press came and met with Prabhupada. They said, what have you come here to do? And Prabhupada said, I have come here to teach you what you've forgotten. They said, what's that? And he said, God. And then he like, walked off. And like, that was it. Like, Prabhupada was like, a, like, like really like, was a big... I mean, Prabhupada also dressed very simply in the humble robes he ate once or twice a day, simple prasadam. He, you know, lived, he didn't live in extravagant opulence. But he put on a show so that people would listen when he got on the mic. Prabhupada was in Detroit. All the leaders of North America came to Detroit and they were all making offerings to Prabhupada. So the boys from New Vrindavan drove up there in a, in a beat up old bus and they picked some flowers by the side of the freeway, like, you know, as they were traveling through the countryside. And they got there with a rinky dink little nothing garland made out of, practically speaking, weeds, you know, the flowering tops of weeds. And Kuladri, who was the temple president there, he was hiding behind a pillar at the Fisher Mansion. Although we also, we bought a mansion. We're like a boat dock on the Detroit River, or whatever that was. It's Detroit River? Lake Michigan, what is it? We bought a massive mansion that had been flown in, like massive chunks of it had been flown in from France and then re-put together. That's how bourgeois these people were. And then Ford's grandson, who was Prabhupada's disciple, bought the mansion for him. It had a boat dock. It was like a serious... Uh, you know, if you've been there, there's a boat dock. Today, there's a boat dock. There. You can go see it. And so, Prabhupada was receiving guests, and there was pillars in the room. He was receiving people, and Kaladri was hiding behind a pillar because he had nothing to offer Prabhupada. And Prabhupada saw him and said, Kaladri, come here. He called him. That's how you call people in India. Instead of going like this, you go. And so he called, and Kaladri came, you know, just with his head hung low, kind of, I don't know, what, whatever the word is, what did he do? He like, uh, I want to say scampered, but that's when you're running away. So whatever it is, if you appro he approached him like, with a lot of shame, feeling very lowly. And Prabhupada said, what have you brought for me? He was actually hiding the garland behind his back. And he had to offer the garland. And Prabhupada took off all his garlands, you know, he's like, you see this sometimes in Prabhupada's pictures. He's buried up to his head in garlands. And he has to take them off, and then he starts garlanding them all over again. So he's buried up to his head in garlands. He had $100 bills and lotus flowers and this and that. He took all his garlands up, and he put that one garland on. And he said, forest flowers, just like Radharani offers to Krishna. And that's all he wore for the rest of the day. 
So that story says something about the nature of Krishna. That Krishna is satisfied with our love. That's what you get the person who has everything. You give them your love. And it's a very simple love. A very pure love. A very unassuming love. A very humble love. And so Krishna wears a garland of forest flowers, decorates his hair with a peacock feather, lives in the forest with his friends, forgets he's God, so does everybody else. And that's what the Supreme Person is doing with his free time when he's not maintaining the universe. That's our idea of what heaven can look like. So, Radharani is that love as a person. And when you cultivate that love, what you're really doing is you're becoming derivative of or nourished by or you're falling in the wake of this love for Krishna. Now the verse I want to read is Radha Krishna Pranaya Vikritir Hladini Shaktir Asmat Ekamana Vapibuvi Pur Deha Vedam Katao Tao. This is a verse about Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, but the first half is about Radha and Krishna. Radha and Krishna Pura Deha Vedam Katao Tao. The two of them, well, <laughs> Radha is Pranaya Vikriti Hladini Shakti Asmat. Radharani is Krishna's pleasure potency. Radharani is a manifestation of Krishna's love. Ekamanao. Atmanao means two people. Eka Atmanao means one, two beings. These two beings are one. Puri Deha Bedam Gatao Tam. Gatao Tao. The two of them have taken different forms eternally to exchange love. Radha and Krishna are one being in two parts. They have achieved two different forms eternally for the purpose of love. Did you follow that? Here's that verse in Bengali. Radha Krishna eka atma dui de hodori Anonye vilase rasa ashwadhana kodi. Radha Krishna eka atma. Radha and Krishna are one soul. Eka atma, one soul. Duhi deha dodi. But they have two forms. <laughs> they have two forms. Why do they have two forms? Anonye bilashe rosha ashwadhana kodi. So that they can taste love with one another. Because the nature of love is that love requires a lover and a beloved to exist. If Krishna is a supreme lover, there has to be a supreme beloved. For love to exist, there have to be two. Therefore, Krishna has always been two, Radha and Krishna. And the two of them together are the proper manifestation of divinity that we worship. Masculine and feminine in this world are because this world is divine-like. Because this world comes from Radha and Krishna. And therefore you find masculinity and femininity in this world. Both things in here within the Absolute. In this sense, Radharani is in Krishna's devotee. She is Krishna. And she is the sweet side of Krishna. And she is the side of Krishna that we worship. Therefore we say, Radha Krishna. She comes first. Hare Krishna. The word Hare is Radharani. We say her name twice as much as Krishna. We say Krishna and we say Ram, right? Each of them four times, eight times, two, three, four, four times. But we say Radharani's name eight times. Even when we say Sri Krishna, the Sri in Sri Krishna is Radharani, it's in the feminine. She's always there, at every step. The Divine Feminine is there. That's our tradition. And I got two points left to make. 
I'm going to skip the first one because it's a little bit racy. So I'm going to drop that one. I was thinking, we'll see if I get there. And so there it is. Um, the second point I want to make was that just a couple days ago, Kat and Varungi called me up to ask me a question. Which, you know, I get asked questions every day of my life. Seven days a week, people call me up and ask me questions. But they asked me a question that really inspired me. And that doesn't always happen. People ask me questions all the time, like, does two plus, what does 2 plus 2 equal? And I'm like, 4. And I'm like, should I break the regular principles? No. Should I chant my rounds? Yes. Should I come to the temple? Yes. Should I, should I you know, give up my service? No. Like, you know, I, I, I get questions like that. And, I'm happy to answer those questions, but you know, I almost feel like I could just record 108 answers to questions and then just, you know, you guys could just press a button and get the answer and save me a bunch of time. But sometimes people ask me questions that really inspire me. So they asked me a question that inspired me. They asked me, I don't even remember your question, I just remember what we talked about. They asked me if we as souls have free will and we can choose to love Krishna and that has value, then wouldn't that make our love more valuable than Radharani's love or than the Cowher Boy's love who fundamentally can't choose not to love Krishna or can they? Did you follow the question? This question is very similar to the Euthyphro question that we asked at the beginning. It's a question which seems difficult to resolve. And so I, we spent about an hour talking about it and I wanted to answer this question with the re remaining minutes that we have. To think of Radharani as choosing to love Krishna is to misunderstand that Radharani is Krishna. In the same way that Krishna is not at fault for being goodness personified, Krishna is also love personified. Therefore, Krishna loving is the most natural thing in the world. And Krishna turning away from love would be to go against God's nature. And an omnipotent being is omnipotent and acts according to its nature. Did you follow this? So Krishna's nature is to be loving. Radharani is the essence of that loving nature. And therefore, for Radharani not to be able to become evil or turn away from love isn't a fault because Radharani is love personified and there's a, there's a mistake in considering Radharani or the cowherd boys and cowherd girls for that matter to be like us when in fact they're not like us. They are divine. The different gopis in the spiritual world, the cowherd boys, are manifestations of Balaram and Radharani. Hey, can you get Jadi a chair? Somebody get Jadi a chair. You don't want a chair? No, it's kind of Oh, it's kind of okay. The guy kind of freaked out. He like, stands above me. He's doing something. I get a little spun out. So I just figured I'll bring him a chair. I hate to be such a baby, but like I'm trying to explain something. It's just like, I feel like I'm being like poked at. Um, To conceive of Radharani as being at fault because she can't choose to love Krishna is to conceive of Radharani as being like us and being a devotee when actually Radharani is Krishna. And therefore, the first answer to the question is that Radharani is Krishna. Did you follow that? Additionally, Krishna does get to experience turning away from himself. You know how Krishna experiences that? Through us because we are microscopic iterations of Krishna that have the ability to either turn towards or turn away from the light. And so if you need to have that in your full conception of divinity, no problem. Our panentheistic conception of divinity, where everything is included within Krishna, also includes us as little mini vibhina angsa, separated parts of Krishna, and we can turn away from Krishna, and therefore that experience or that exists within transcendence in the form of us, so we got that base covered. Do you guys follow that one? And we never really turn away from Krishna, because Krishna's everywhere. 
So the idea you're turning away from Krishna is itself a temporal illusion. And so actually nothing turns away from Krishna because we also can't go against our nature and our nature is to be connected to Krishna and therefore it's not, it's not, uh, it's not technically correct to say we really turn away from Krishna. We turn towards Krishna remotely instead of directly. Do you guys follow this? What was your answer, which I liked? Huh? And? Got it. Yeah. I'll leave your stuff for another time. He, I, he said something I really liked, and I, of course I forgot it. And so I got to ask him to remind me. I wanted to add it to my, to my toolbox. I also, I think that when we tell people to use your free will to turn towards Krishna, and we're telling you to go from a zero to a one, Remember before, like I said over here, you're trying to get people to be from an atheist to being a theist, and so you're moving from a zero to a one, but over here you get to do art, and you know there's still rules, so it's like architecture, but you're no longer moving from a zero to a one. You're actually, you're doing something beautiful. You go beyond mere math, and you get into the realm where there's, there's artistic flair. We have this idea that free will means you can always choose to disintegrate and ruin a relationship and make it zero. But I think that's a pretty impoverished notion of what free will means. I think for us, where we are right now, those are the kind of decisions we need to make. We need to turn towards Krishna directly instead of remotely. But when you do that sufficiently, love for Krishna also becomes part of your being and part of your nature. Not remotely, but more and more directly. Like I mentioned, even when we choose illusion here, we're really choosing remote Krishna. We're attracted to glittering things in this world which are a little bit reminiscent of Krishna and we just forgot to go to the real thing. As you advance in spiritual life, you become more divine. And you reacquire your divine nature. You reactivate it. You rejuvenate it. It was always there. It was covered. As you rejuvenate that divine nature, you're no longer acting according to your nature by turning away from Krishna. It becomes more natural and automatic that you turn towards Krishna in newer and newer ways. And your expression of free will is Purna, Purnatara, and Purnatama your complete, more complete, and most complete, infinitely increasing expressions of love to Krishna. Sorry. Sir, I'm sorry that she coughed and you were wearing a mask. Obviously, I don't want to make, put you at any risk, so I feel very much for you. But she's actually my aunt, and she came to visit me at my personal request, so I feel so badly. No, it's, it's okay. I'm also sorry. So on, on her behalf, I please my forgiveness, and he's my uncle, and I definitely don't want to offend him. So I apologize on his behalf, and I apologize on their behalf. But if there's some problem like that, we can work it out. You don't need to become angry. We should be happy... Today we should be happy. No problem. No problem. Um, thank you. Thank you. Um. <laughs> As we turn towards Krishna, we don't lose our free will. We just learn how to ride a bike and then we don't forget. We learn how to love and that becomes part of who we are. And so in a lot of ways, the sojourn back to Krishna 
isn't that you're just always choosing one instead of zero at every moment for all eternity. And at any moment you could then go and reverse the whole thing and ruin everything. It's rather you become who you always were more directly. You realize who you always were. And that realization, in a lot of ways, is reminiscent of, derivative of, partaking in, touching, being nourished by Radharani's original love for Krishna. Because that idea of loving one another, that is Radha and Krishna. They are love personified. And as we become um, immersed in and nourished by and sheltered by Radharani's love, that again becomes our activated nature. And then there's no more question of turning away from Krishna. In the same way that Krishna never turns away from himself, and it's not a flaw. In the same way that Radharani never turns away from Krishna, and it's not a flaw. That same thing can also apply to us. And we have a misunderstanding that somehow, like, we're always going to be moving from a zero to a one, but that's not actually the case. Did you guys follow that? So, yes, God exists. God's all good. We can reconcile that with suffering. There's room for free will. You have to choose to move from a zero to a one. We have to do some of the building blocks of a philosophy, of a theology, answer some of the basic questions to get people off the ground. Can somebody close that door, please? I know, but it just doesn't take that long, man. It's like multiple like counts. I know. It's just like he's got to figure something else out. It's like freaking me out. When he's got to count the number of people, he's got to count the number of people. Got you. I'm a hater. Thank you for correcting me. I'll admit it. I'm a hater. Somehow it like just bugs me. <laughs> of course, all of those came from in there. So he could have counted them in there and spared me. I'm a lovable hater, right? All right, so just to wrap it up, just to wrap it up before all of your phones start ringing off the hook because <laughs> no one bothers to turn them off. Make sure I turn mine on. In the beginning, we got to do some of the building blocks. Your consciousness, it's irreducible. There's a source. What's the nature of that source? God's all good. Here's how you reconcile evil. Love requires two. Therefore, individuality must exist. You're an individual. Therefore, God must be an individual. Principles like goodness and love, we think of them as being abstract, third-party principles, but there's no reason to assume that. If you're a personalist, then their original manifestation was as a person, and therefore Krishna is goodness and love personified, which solves any number of problems. Radharani is that also. And to some extent, we are too. And we're just small enough that we can be covered, but we can never really be extinguished. And we never really turn away from divinity. We just turn towards remote divinity. And as you grow and as you heal, really as you participate in Radharani's love and allow her love to nourish you, then spirituality turning towards Krishna becomes natural. And you follow in the wake of her love. And that's why our sadhana is ultimately called Rag Anuga. Our sadhana follows in the footsteps. Anuga means it follows. It follows after. It follows after the ragatmakas, those who are made of love. Ragatmaka means made of love. And so the great angels in our tradition, as well as Radha and Krishna, are ragatmik. They're made of love. And we are rag anuga. We follow in their love. And so our conception of heaven is there's a place where every step is a dance, every word's a song. Krishna has no weapons. He plays a flute. His gems have been given up. He's wearing a peacock feather. All of his opulence is diminished so that his love can fully express itself because rulers make for bad lovers. And there's a corner of heaven where people love God so much and so intensely, so perpetually, that they forget he's God and just embrace him like their child, like their friend, like their lover. And Radharani is that original embracer of God who is Krishna. And here's a final little meditation for us.
Mriga Moda Ta Ganda Joichi Aviceda Agni Jvalate Joichi Kabu Nahi Beda. Just like musk and its fragrance, just like fire and its flames, there is no difference between them. Mriga Mada means that which makes the deer mad. Because the musk makes, the, the deer smells his own musk. And it's like, oh my God, where is that? But it's inside him and he doesn't know. And so he's running around searching for the musk, but he is the musk. The like original fixator of, like, of, all, of all perfumes, the original base note of, of perfumes. That is the deer. So Mriga Mada makes the deers mad. Targanda and its the, the, the musk and its scent, the fire and its flames. There's actually no different. That's how we see Radha and Krishna. A blue and a yellow lotus flower coming from a single stem. Musk and its scent, flame and fire. One, but somehow it's different. You can say the fire's flames. And it's not wrong. You can say Musk's scent, and you're not wrong. You can say the sun's light, and you're not wrong. You can say the sun's heat, and you're not wrong. But what is the sun but heat and light? What is a fire but its flames? What is Musk but its scent? But still, you can refer to the thing and its attribute, and you can refer to them separately, although actually, if you think about it, they're really one and the same. These are the examples that our theologians came up with in this world to try to get us to wrap their, our heads around the idea they were trying to convey to us. If you understand this idea, then you'll never ask questions like, can Radharani turn away from Krishna? Can Krishna make a square circle? Such nonsense questions won't apply to you anymore. Can Krishna speak a lie? Can Krishna do something evil? So those questions won't apply to you because you'll have properly understood what we really mean when we say God. These questions are because you haven't understood our theological conception of God. Once you understand that conception, all these questions and zillions of others get automatically answered. They evaporate and then you're free to really start to love because you're past that honeymoon phase, you're past that getting to know you phase, and you can actually dive into transcendence. Okay. So we're not going to do a kirtan. Unless you guys want to do a kirtan? <laughs> They're going to do some kirtan. And so maybe we can sit down. They can sit and do some bhajan. If you guys want to stay... You can stay while they do light bhajan, heavy light. And then if you want to go, we've got plates of prasad for you because it's late. And so it's entirely up to you. You can leave now. You can stay a little bit for kirtan. We're not going to have arti because the doors are closed. But thank you very, very much for your kind attention. Hare Krishna. Shushi.